All right, here we go. All right. Okay. All right, hey. Hey, Chris, thanks for joining us. Hey, Robert, how are you? Good, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Can you uh, hear and see me okay? Okay, good, there we go. And I believe we're live. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, we're gonna have a great conversation about crypto and the way the internet is headed. Um, Chris, I, uh, I wanted to kick things off and, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to be the one to have to do this, but, you know, the Bitcoin bubble popped at the end of 2017. What, what are you doing raising another crypto fund? <laughs> yeah, um, we've heard that a few times before. The, um, our, our view is that, um, that crypto, like a lot of emerging technologies, has kind of evolved in waves. Um, and, and that the, one of the interesting things with crypto is you have prices, of course, in addition to kind of core innovation. Um, which is a little bit different than other areas like AI and mobile phones and things like this. Um, but if you kind of go back and analyze it, you'll see that um, there were kind of, we, we think of it as there have been three waves so far. There was a 2011 wave, 2013 wave, and 2017 wave, which is the one you're referring to. Um, 2011 wave, I think before 2011, um, the people that were into Bitcoin were kind of super hardcore cypherpunks, uh, you know, I don't know, like real hardcore tech enthusiasts. Uh, uh, even the enthusiasts didn't really think there could be businesses created out of, I think, out of Bitcoin. Um, after 2011, the price went up. That led to kind of more social media activity, more people kind of getting involved, and very importantly, more developers and entrepreneurs. And that that right after that period is when you had companies like Coinbase and Bitmain and a, and a bunch of companies we know today, kind of miners and exchanges, um, get started. And then you know, things were humming along, still kind of a small space. Then 2013 happened, which, uh, you know, the Bitcoin price went up again. And that generated, if you kind of go look at Google Trends and the press, there was a whole bunch of kind of press activity. And I think 2013 was probably the first time that most people who weren't sort of hardcore tech enthusiasts heard about Bitcoin and crypto. Um, and then, and if you look at the, the stats after that, there was a lot more GitHub activity, developers getting involved. Um, there was a lot more startup activity uh, uh, venture capitalists and entrepreneurs and things kind of getting involved in the space. Um, importantly, after 2013, you had, a, I think, a real broadening of kind of what it meant to be in the crypto space beyond Bitcoin. And that's when you had, you know, the introduction of Ethereum, for example, and a bunch of new ideas and new, new networks getting developed. And then 2017 came along driven by a bunch of things. I think, you know, some of the things around the Bitcoin forks and, and I think a lot of it having to do with kind of innovation on top of Ethereum and, and ERC-20 tokens and a whole bunch of other things. And that drove another wave of kind of, of, of prices going up. But more importantly, not, you know, we, we really try not to focus on the near term prices. What we're what, what, what excited us about 2017 was all of the innovation that came out of it. And so probably, you know, something on the order of, um, you know, a few dozen very, very high quality projects came out of 2017. Um, uh, we, we have this experience a lot where we meet entrepreneurs and we ask them, how did you get into the space? And it's almost always 2011, 2013, 2017. I was in college. My roommate was day trading Bitcoin. I started, I said, what is this stuff? It sounds crazy. Then I started reading the technical papers and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I want to start a company. And so I think one of the really, we'll talk about this more later, hopefully, but like one of the really exciting things about where we are now, 2020 is the seeds that were planted in the last wave, 2017, 18, are now finally starting to kind of bloom and a whole bunch of projects are launching this year. Um, and, 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 you know, just like if, if you kind of go back and look at it again, like mobile AI, AI, for example, very famously machine learning. Well, now AI and machine learning are now synonymous. They weren't always, but AI very famously went through all these summers and winters. If you talk to people in the space until it finally had kind of this now, this real kind of enduring uh, spring. Yeah, you know, since like 2013 or so, and I think crypto will be the same thing, and then eventually it will take off and be kind of this this major thing. Like, and, that, and that's and that's the premise of our, um, you know, why we're investing in the space and, and bullish. That uh, AI seasonality used to take place over the course of decades, but in the crypto sphere, this stuff, yeah. to, you know, change by the minute. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Uh, AI. I mean, so a couple couple things to say there. Um, AI until. Google, Facebook, et cetera, was dependent on government funding. Essentially, if you go back and look at it, it was basically government funded and university funded. And so what, what would happen is, you know, DARPA would decide AI is important in 1965 or something. And then 
fund it for a while and then be disappointed that they couldn't beat, you know, chess grandmasters and then they would stop funding it and they'd wait 10 years. Uh, you know, one difference in the world today is it's just a much faster clock speed. You've just got a lot more kind of money flowing through the system. The, frankly, just the tech space is just so much bigger, right? I mean, like it's now kind of a mainstream phenomenon. Um, the coverage is much broader. It's global. Um, there are these, these incredible tools like GitHub and Slack and, you know, Discord and all these things where people can organize throughout the world. You know, a few people can have an idea and, you know, uh, distribute it around the world, get together, use these online tools, create something really cool, get, you know, catalyze a community. Like you just get a much faster clock speed today, I think in general, um, and specifically in crypto, which I think to me, I, I kind of distinguish technologies between what I would call kind of like inside out and outside in. I've written a blog post about this. What I mean by this is, Inside out posts, sorry, inside out um, technologies, they tend to come from big tech incumbents. So, for example, the mobile phone, right? So, the, the two kind of big winners there on the platform side were obviously Apple and Google. Um, whereas, let's say, open source software very much came from the fringes, right? It was, you know, uh, Linus and a whole bunch of other kind of really uh, innovative, but not, you know, not, not sort of from the establishment, right? They're sort of outside the establishment. Um, and they, but they created these incredible things, which then kind of went up and now Linux is dominant, right? Like it's the main cloud operating system that everyone uses. Um, and, and so I think crypto is much more of one of these outside in kind of things where it's not gonna, the, most of the innovations is less likely to come from kind of the establishment from, you know, top universities and top um, corporations. It'll come from the fringes. And that also increases the kind of clock speed and the rate at which things happen. And so it's very like, it's a little bit chaotic, but it's like a very sort of fast moving high cadence, um, uh, uh, tech sector, and I think that's one of the things that makes it so fun and exciting. By the way, you've mentioned the increased participation and the global nature of this whole thing. I want to make sure that everybody in the audience here knows that uh, we're going to be taking questions uh, after the 40-minute mark, so uh, please do think about anything you might like to ask Chris, and I will uh, read your questions on, on behalf of him. Um, you can just submit them in the chat feature to the right over here. I think it's over here. Um, Great. Uh, so, Chris, I also want to touch on, once again, this new fund you've raised. Mm -hmm. um, investment in blockchain businesses has been going down recently. I mean, it was uh, going gangbusters a few years ago, uh, but, uh, you know, that the, the amount that VCs are actually putting into the sector has gone down uh, substantially. Uh, I think the figure was $4.3 billion in uh, 2018, and it's gone down by a third or so since then. Mm -hmm. um, what do you know that all of the other VCs don't know? Well, I, I think that's, I'd say a couple of things. I'm a little bit skeptical of some of that data sometimes because they include things that I wouldn't like, I don't know, like there was a big wave of things that I wouldn't necessarily consider kind of the type of crypto that we do at least. Um, but, uh, but I, you know, I think that there's, I mean, there's a lot of very active crypto funds that we work a lot with. Um, there's sort of 10 or so kind of major ones that are very active and, um, uh, you know, and continue to be excited. So, um, but like the, the VC industry is very kind of trendy. Everyone runs, it's like kid soccer or something. It's like everyone's running after the ball and then everyone else runs after the ball. I, I, I don't try to predict the VC industry and, and the various trends. I, I, I have found throughout my career that um, betting on uh, the internet and very smart people building new exciting things on the internet has been a good, a generally good bet. Um, uh, you know, I was doing that since basically my entire career and I was doing you know, consumer internet in the early 2000s when that was sort of not it was sort of out of fashion, continue to do that as an entrepreneur through the financial crisis. Um, so, you know, I just I believe fundamentally in the long term potential of the internet. I think we're still in the early stages of the internet. Um, I believe in kind of very smart people uh, who try to who, who want to build exciting new products. And I found that to always be you know, um, a good bet. And so, and that's where I, I see those people coming here. I, I see the, you know, the things that excite me, for example, um, uh, our friend Dan Benet teaches a class at Stanford on crypto cryptocurrencies. Um, and he had something on the order of 200 students last semester. I went and had the chance to speak there. Um, uh, very excited students. Yeah, we just had a crypto startup school, uh, which, which was originally an offline event and became an online event. We had it was something on the order of 1500 very high um, quality applicants from all over kind of the tech world. Um, I see a lot of excitement from people. I mean, it skews kind of more technical and and kind of people that I'd say 
want to be on the frontier. I think there's certain there's a certain personality type, you know, that wants to go and, you know, be have like Nerf guns and sushi at Google. And there's another personality type that wants to um, do cutting edge pioneering kind of Wild West stuff. And those folks, I think, are all coming into this space. And um, I've always found those people to be a good bet. And that's that's kind of what we're betting on. But, you know, I guess time will tell. Um, this industry is quite a roller coaster. I mean, there's massive volatile price swings going up and down. Uh, you know, people's moods swing between dread and extreme optimism uh, mm -hmm. frequently. Um, have there been any moments when you have had second thoughts, when you may have had your faith shaken and uh, felt like, oh, crap, uh, you know, maybe I placed the wrong bet here? No, I think that to me, the only, to, okay, to me, I guess what I would say is there's, there's, uh, I, I have found that when you when you're in the sort of internet software business, um, I have found that the quote easy thing to predict is what's going to happen. I put in quotes because it's not that easy, but the really hard thing to predict is the timing. Um, and so, for example, I started a machine learning company called Hunch in 2008 and sold it. We sold it to eBay in 2011, and I thought, um, you know, I thought I was. I thought I was late, I guess, to the machine learning thing. When, in fact, in retrospect, uh, it was very, very early and really kind of kicked into high gear in 2013. Uh, I had friends doing mobile phone applications in the mid, early to mid 2000s. I had one friend who gave up on mobile in 2006. That's never going to happen. And we're kind of pretend. I mean, mobile people don't realize who, who weren't around. Like mobile was a thing going on since. I mean, you know, these companies like General Magic were 92 or three or something, right? It was 15 years in. And a lot of people were like, it's just, you know, on the one hand, it just seemed obvious. Like, of course, you're going to carry a computer around in your pocket. Like, of course, you know, there's got to be a, the, you know, we've got the internet, we've got all these things. Like, of course, somebody's going to finally crack it. On the other hand, it was, it was just taking longer, right? So for me, it's never a question. I, I've never doubted it's going to happen. Like, all of these kinds of things that we're, people in the space are excited about and been talking about at this conference, for example. I know they're all going to happen. I just I believe that um, very strongly. I think the timing is another question, and specifically when you're investing and you're running a if you're running a startup or a project, the timing is very important, right? Because you have a certain amount of capital, a certain runway. Um, so it's very easy to kind of prognosticate and say, oh, this is going to happen, and everything else. It's very different to kind of get from here to there, um, and what are the things that have to happen? I guess, and and one of the things I think we try to think a lot about is kind of looking at things from a bottoms up as opposed to a top down perspective. So top down, you kind of say this broad historical brush every 10 to 15 years, new computing platform. It's been 13 years since the iPhone. We're kind of due for something new and there's a whole bunch of candidates. But really, I like to look at it more bottom up, like what needs to happen? For example, what needs to happen to create a successful cryptocurrency based global payment system? You know, and, and I think the answer there is, for example, the, the past attempts at this didn't have the right user experience, didn't have the right settlement time, had too much currency volatility. There were a bunch of things. And like, so how do you specifically fix those? Who's working on it? You know, it's so a really kind of going down deep into the weeds. And, and when you look at it from that perspective, I think we're on, in a really interesting time right now where a whole bunch of um, work has been done over the last decade that's, I believe, about to bear fruit over the next 12 months with a bunch of very, very... Um, high quality projects launching. Um, so we'll see, you know, like it, it's obviously, um, um, you know, it's hard to predict these things in the near term, but um, but I think it's, I think, I think we're getting to a point where it's a, it's a very exciting time. Uh, while it is hard to predict things in the near term, over the next 12 months, what is coming out? What do you expect to happen? How do you expect the landscape to change? Yeah, I mean, I think some of the folks uh, sponsoring this conference, for example, uh, like Near and um, Filecoin, and I think maybe I'm not sure of their schedule, um, but I think maybe Polkadot um, are, are launching soon. Um, uh, I think you'll see. I think some sometime this year, probably you'll see Libra um, and other kind of payment blockchains like that launch. I think. Um, uh, what else? Um, uh, I think that go, going back to sort of Near and Polkadot, I think um, one thing I'll say, I think it's very, a very important. Uh, Getting a, a, a if uh, in the history of every kind of computing wave, having a um, general purpose kind of base layer programmable infrastructure has been a very important thing to unlock innovation. And we saw that with Ethereum and how many um, different projects that launched. Ethereum 1.0 has limitations um, around the settlement time and the transaction costs. 
which has, I think, limited it to uh, working very well in certain areas like DeFi. And DeFi has, I think, worked really, really well when you look at the numbers. Um, but other applications like gaming and payments and other things are very hard with that infrastructure. And so I think uh, it will be a huge thing, a huge unlock to have uh, more performance, scalable layer one blockchains, which I think we're now on the cusp of, for example, and that will then unlock a second wave of applications on top. Um, uh, what else? Um, I and mean, there's a whole there's a whole range of in our portfolio. I think like a significant number are, are launching this year. So, uh, Andreessen remains one of the investors in the Libra Association, which has made a lot of changes recently to its uh, its layout um, and and its setup. What are you expect? Are you expecting that to launch this year? And if so, I guess what should we expect to see from that project? Yeah, I don't know. So I, I don't know the exact. I'm not the. So my partner Katie Hahn is the lead on that, and so she knows the details. Um, and I'm not sure what we're supposed to say or not. But I, I think I say I'm optimistic of like a relatively near term launch. Um, and there, you know, and I think there's just a lot of really high quality people working on that project. I think it's being underestimated. Um, by the general public, um, and you know, I think it's I think it's a really powerful application. I think having um, a global payment system is exciting for a number of reasons. One, sort of the obvious reason is um, there are something on the order of a billion and a half, two billion people who have smartphones now but don't have bank accounts, um, and those people can now um, uh, you know be kind of included in the digital economy, and that, I think that's very powerful. Um, you know, I think another important thing is right now payments are very siloed. It reminds me of messaging kind of pre WhatsApp. So you had like, I'm on BBM and you're on this and you're on this SMS and you had to pay lots of money. And you think about messaging for those old enough to remember messaging kind of pre iPhone era was expensive. It was, you had lots of interoperability issues and now it's just, we just take it for granted. You can send a tech, you can video chat, you can do all these things for free. And I think it'll be the same thing with money. And that will then unlock other things. You think about the software that we're using right now, right? This is this is because of video conferencing. You're now able to build this whole experience around video conferencing and have a virtual conference and keep the world kind of, at least this small part of the world kind of going during this difficult time. Um, I think a similar thing will happen once you have like true digital money, you'll be able to build other kind of experiences around it and it will unlock opportunities. So it, it will unlock opportunities for software developers, for entrepreneurs, small businesses, creative people to like build all sorts of other cool things. Um, once we can kind of make money truly like a, a first class internet software object. Um, and so, and look, and so, and Libra's doing a lot of hard work. There's a lot of regulatory questions, a lot of technical questions, a lot of kind of community oriented questions. And to their credit, they're they're taking on a lot of those, uh, those hard, um, jobs, and I think that will help a lot of other projects as well. Um, uh, you know, and just kind of blaze a trail for the space. I had the pleasure of getting to know the Libra team pretty well uh, when I wrote a story about them earlier this year. Um, and one thing that didn't really make it into my story, but that I thought was quite interesting, is just how all this blockchain technology that they're working on, and Mark Zuckerberg's vision about making a more private. Uh, decentralized social network. I feel like there's a big confluence there, and you know, you might even see some some platform movement from what Facebook looks like today to something more crypto focused in the future. Um, but I wonder, given given those sorts of giants like Facebook out there, uh, Twitter's Jack Dorsey is obviously very interested in Bitcoin. Like, are these giants going to co-opt the crypto revolution, or is there room for upstarts to take them on? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, like my my kind of broad view is I want you know the more the more the better. You know, we want um, uh, if Twitter wants to get involved, Facebook wants to get involved, startups want to get involved. That's great. Like I just want to see kind of more people working on stuff, contributing ideas, working together. Um, you know, one of the nice things about blockchains is uh, the it's and this is it, it's really a unique thing. It's it's they're unique in this way and different than all other kinds of computers. Is that um, you only have to, in a properly built blockchain that's open source and has other properties, you don't have to trust the organizations behind it. You only have to trust the code. Um, and so that's a very important feature, um, especially when you kind of when you raise the issue you do, which is, um, uh, you know, I guess, I guess I would say even if you don't, and I know there's people that don't trust some of these large companies. Um, that's one of the nice things here is that if, if they do it right, if the code is open, if 
if people can join, you know, anyone can join, um, that fundamentally you trust in the architecture, not the not the folks behind it. And it's open source too. So that means I think one of the great things here is that as um, like, for example, Facebook open sourced their move programming language, which I thought was really innovative. And they did some innovative things which have already inspired other projects. Um, and so, for example, in move, um, uh, money is a sort of first class uh, 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 native variable type and has various properties and it's really innovative and other, and that's then propagated out. I've already seen other teams kind of um, uh, building on top of that. Um, so, so I, I, I don't know. I'm, I, I think if anything, there's, you know, you have Jack Dorsey, you have Facebook, uh, you still haven't seen a lot from the other kind of big tech incumbents. I think if anything, um, I'd like to see more, uh, more, more of those companies get involved, frankly. Um, I'm sure there are lots of people in the audience here who are, you know, itching to pitch you their own ideas. Uh, what advice do you have for what sorts of things they should focus on? Yeah, so we we did this this crypto startup school, which by the way, we're we videotaped everything and we're going to put it all online, open source, et cetera, very soon. Um, and that was meant to I, I'll I'll try to answer your question, but also say like it's a long answer to the question. And that's why we did that school partly was we wanted to kind of try to encapsulate all the things we've learned over the last you know seven years. I've been at the firm doing this and just sort of 10 years of just collectively throughout the, you know, with all of our friends and things, um, take all of those things we've learned and kind of, uh, you know, and encapsulate it and, and sort of share it with the world. Um, so that, that's what the point of that, that program was. Um, and, and hopefully as we release that, that will be helpful. Um, and there's just, just, there's certain things which, you know, are unknowable at this point, like consumer adoption patterns and a whole bunch of other kind of things, but there's certain things that we've like now figured out, like what are the best practices with respect to, uh, you know, the the financing, how you finance these projects, what are the best practices with, with respect to how you think about kind of regulatory issues? Um, what are the best practices around um, organizations and remote work and just all sorts of other kind of questions that people have. And we think we've learned some of these things or at least have some idea about them. And so are trying to sort of share that with the world. Um, I think a very important thing whenever there's a new technology is, is um, make sure that the things you're building are really kind of unique and sort of uh, unique and really take advantage of the strength of that technology. Um, uh, you know, so if you, if you think about the things that really worked on mobile phones, um, they were things like Uber and Lyft and Snapchat and Instagram, which really couldn't have existed on desktop computers. You could have had photo sharing and you did have photo sharing on desktop computers, but it was a very different. Instagram and Snapchat were built from the ground up to be a phone in your pocket and to be location based and um, and and just the whole design philosophy and everything. In fact, Instagram, I think for a couple of years, didn't even have a desktop site. Um, obviously, Uber and Lyft and things like this couldn't exist without a portable GPS and and all the other kinds of things, a mobile phone. So if you look, think about the really exciting ideas whenever there's a new wave of computing, it tends to be things that couldn't have existed in the prior paradigm. Um, and so, you know, I think that's like, so for example, you know, I think really exciting thing going on now are DAOs, uh, digital autonomous organizations, right? So Compound, which we're investors in, is a lending lending protocol that's now sort of becoming a DAO over time. Um, and the, they'll be um, basically owned by the community of users in the same way that Maker is today. Um, and I think that that and, and they're doing some really important work kind of trailblazing on the regulatory side, on the legal side and on the kind of technical side and governance, and other issues. And I think as they do that, I hope, you know, those ideas will propagate to other projects. Um, but that's the kind of thing like a DAO, which just simply couldn't have existed. Um, uh, so a DAO, just another way to think of a DAO, by the way, is, I didn't probably explain it fully, is it's a it's sort of like a digital co-op. It's a it's a a digital service that's owned by owned and operated by a community instead of by a company. Right. And that, to me, that's a very, very powerful idea. Um, there's a great book I read. It was the history of the corporation. It was a history of a limited liability corporation. And I think we take it for granted today, this idea of limited liability that like, if I invest money in a startup, you come to me and pitch me a startup and I invest money. The worst I can do is lose the money. Right. If you do something really bad, I don't have to worry about beyond that. Um, that, that was a new idea. I think it was around the 1830s with the railroad boom in the UK. They had them before, but they required like an act of parliament. So there were like five of them or something. Um, but during the railroad boom, they needed a new way to do capital, capital formation. Um, people wanted to invest in railroads, but like if somebody, you know, if there was some liability issue, they didn't want to risk things beyond their money. They kept going to parliament to get uh, these approvals. And finally, uh, it took a long time. It took decades. Um, 
uh, you know, the, the government decided, okay, we should, we should institutionalize these things. And now, of course, we take it for granted, the Delaware C Corp, all these other kinds of things. And that unlocked a huge wave of investment, capital formation. You know, you were able to take people with money from one area of the world or country and unite them with other people who had a town who wanted to get a train track there and the train track folks and all the other kinds of things, right? Um, and I think, so the way I think about it is, you know, we've had the internet for 25, you know, the, the kind of mainstream internet for 25-ish years. And we've gra we've grafted this kind of, this business uh, uh, construction, this Delaware C Corp, which really came from the railroad industry. We've grafted it onto this new modern kind of technology of networks. Um, and that's created all sorts of issues. Um, why should a small opaque product committee at a social network be deciding uh, who gets access to that platform, who gets demonetized or monetized, uh, how the rankings work, uh, which news organizations are allowed on there, what is fake news? All very, very important questions, right? Um, did, did we want, did, like, was it our intention, our being society's intention, to have that run by a small opaque product management committee at a large company? Wouldn't it be better if, you know, we all used a community owned and operated version of Twitter where the community could come together and decide on these very important issues or vote on them or whatever, have some kind of power over them where the community could enjoy the upside of the economics where the early Uber driver um, could, could, could get the upside of Uber in the same way the early Bitcoin holder got the upside of Bitcoin. Um, these are, to me, these are very exciting, profound ideas that couldn't exist before crypto. They could be society changing. They could unlock new waves of innovation, new ways, types of capital formation. Um, uh, frankly, you know, have big impact on what I think are kind of going to become. I mean, these issues I just described, these are only going to get more acute. Like these are not getting less acute. Right. It's going to be five to 10 years from now. Like if you think about five years ago, the things I just described seemed like science fiction. I think five years from now, they're going to be, you know, core kind of um, uh, core kind of societal issues we have to confront. Um, so I don't know, this is my long winded way of saying, like, I think these like new things that couldn't exist before are the most exciting things about crypto. And specifically, like I just cited DAOs as one of them. And I'm, I could go on and on about DAOs for another hour if you want, but hopefully <laughs> let's talk about something else. Well, DAO's got a pretty uh, difficult branding in the beginning with you know, the investment vehicle that got hacked. And, yeah. um, no, I mean, that was that, that was a, just a no. Like, it was the, it was a DAO, but it was also called the DAO specifically. Right. Yeah, it got hacked, and I mean that, and like that was that definitely a bad thing. Um, it, it wasn't to me though. It was a flaw in the implementation. It had a bug as opposed to a flaw. You know, it'd be sort of like. You have the first limited live. I'm sure in the beginning of limited liability corporations, there were bad ones. That doesn't mean that the structure is bad, right? It's like it, there's bad apples all over. You know, anyways, but but yeah, you're right. It, the branding needs some work. That's why it takes it took a little it's taken a little while to to kind of get over that. I think. Uh, one question that rises in my mind when it comes to these sort of community uh, operated uh, kinds of networks is, you know, how do you prevent something from splintering apart into some kind of like internet cesspool of QAnon conspiracy theories and neo-Nazi sites. Like, yeah. The dredge of the internet is constantly trying to engulf the whole thing. Yeah. Well, that that's a great question. I mean, that, and that's like, you know, there's different four ways of answering that. Right. So the, uh, I mean, you know, if you think about the design of the original Bitcoin's design, right. That that's why you have proof of work. It's sort of an anti-spam mechanism, right. So it's just so not anyone and that obviously is not, sort of content related like you're discussing, but it's more, how do you make sure the bad actors don't subvert the system and throw all these machines at it and vote for, you know, bad blocks and things like that. And the incredibly brilliant answer that Satoshi had was, well, you make them, you know, prove it by spending money on proof of work, you know, effectively spending money through electricity. Um, and then other systems since then have come up with other methods for like so-called so civil resistance, um, proof of stake, we have to put money in a escrow and it gets slashed if something bad happens. And so there's a bunch of really smart work happening there. Um, it's all like, it's always a risk with, I think the internet, I think the question is, I think you're going to need some form. So when you talk about like social networks, for example, if we, as I think we will have in the next few years, have kind of crypto community owned and operated crypto powered community owned and operated social networks, how are we going to, someone is going to have to curate that. There's going to have to be a mechanism. 
Um, I think, look, but I think, look, I think we've seen throughout the history of the internet a lot of really good kind of bottoms up curation mechanisms. So you think about going back to eBay, you have the star ratings, and then you have people rating the, you know, the star ratings. Like on Amazon, you have kind of like two layers of ratings, Uber star ratings, you know, Reddit, for example, I think has a very, uh, uh, effective kind of karma system. You can debate whether you like each subreddit, but it, like the karma system within each subreddit um, is it, generally effective, um, I find, um, as opposed to some other systems like maybe like Twitter or something where the app replies seem less ranked or something. So I think I, I'm not at all, I think it's a very important question. You certainly don't want these things to devolve that way. And that is, I agree with you, it is sort of the natural gravitational pull to, of things on the internet, unfortunately. Um, but but I think that there are um, now at this point we have a toolbox of um, ways to combat that, and I think that there's no reason that that toolbox can't be wielded by a community as opposed to by a private company. Chris, how are you spending your time in quarantine? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, you mean just like personally? I mean, so I'm you know we're 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 pretty. I mean, we're fortunate in that in our job we can continue to do. Um, a lot of it over video, I think, you know, and, and uh, we're obviously lucky in that way that we can do that. And so um, we're, we're doing a lot of, you know, what we normally do, which is uh, I had this at, later this afternoon, I'm, you know, meeting with a, uh, some crypto entrepreneurs who are raising money, um, um, spending a lot of time with our existing uh, investments. Um, uh, what else? It's harder, you know, it's interesting. This whole, like, it'll be interesting to see, you know, hopefully this, the pandemic gets uh, resolved relatively soon and, you know, and we have the choice, people have the choice to go back to work in, in jobs like ours. I expect, of course, essential services will go back to work sooner. I think people like us being less essential will take longer. But, um, um, you know, I think uh, um, one of the challenges I think in quarantine is kind of getting to know new people. Um, it's harder. I think it's easier to, my, my mental model, it's easier to maintain um, relationships and to do sort of more informational uh, meetings. It's harder to do kind of the more getting to know you, kind of the more emotional side of human interaction. Um, so we're still kind of working through that. Um, um, what else can I say? I think it's, you know, um, I don't know, trying to trying to keep keep my mental health and exercise and things like that. But, um, but uh, you know, like I said, we're, we're relatively uh, lucky in that we can mostly do our mostly do our job over video. Has this widespread shift of virtual influenced any of your thinking or the way that you might manage your uh, upcoming investments? Well, um, yeah, it's a great question. I think a couple of things I would say. I'd say um, I'd say generally, if you're an entrepreneur, even outside of crypto, I think this is a good reminder that you want to have um, uh, enough runway, not enough cash uh, to survive through a downturn. I mean, you know, since, I guess I, in my career now, I've seen the 2001 downturn, the 2000 uh, seven, seven downturn in this, it seems like, you know, every couple of years we're having one of these, um, unfortunately, uh, some kind of thing that, that makes, you know, that that's, makes a very challenging time. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of, as an entrepreneur, you want to keep your folks employed. You want to keep building your product. You want to keep, um, selling to customers or whatever the case might be. Um, um, and the the key thing, the, the number one thing you need for that is the cash. So I think it's it's been a reminder. Now, in crypto, uh, I think people are already used to winters, quote unquote winters. You know, these three to four year dry spells, where as you say, the kind of VCs go away. Like this has happened a couple times, and they go away, and they come back, and they go away. And so people had been managing to longer runways already for the most part. Uh, like in our portfolio, they've been managing to three or four year as opposed to two year or something, which is typical in VC. And so that makes them more, a little bit more relatively insulated. Um, I think, I think, you know, like I, I, from I guess my view is just um, all the things we're doing, kind of focusing on the digital world and the digital economy and modernizing what I think of as very dated infrastructure. I mean, look at look at the. Um, I, I think all those things are only going to probably accelerate, frankly, with this um, with the situation. Uh, the government right now is trying to send out, you know, these uh, payments, and I, my understanding is they're doing it through the USPS mail, which, you know, um, they don't really have a good list of, I, you know, they, they I, my understanding is they couldn't even really send money directly to small businesses. They do it through banks. I think the banks are taking tens of billions of dollars in fees for literally just distributing that money. I, I think it's, you know, look, I'm not crypto is not ready today to do this. Frankly, it's an emerging space. So I'm not saying that like 
crypto could handle it today. But I do think it does highlight the fact that that the financial infrastructure could could use modernization. I I think that I think um, so. To me, it, it kind of reaffirms that belief. Um, and I think also another thing I'd say about it is, you know, a lot of these things. If you if you look at a lot of the the discussions around tech internet products over the last decade, you had all these things, you know, hey, we asked for flying cars and all we got was 140 characters. At least for me, I think that this situation, the quarantine has reminded us that, that 140 characters are pretty important. Video conferencing is really important. Slack is really important. You know, e-commerce is really important. Uh, you know, I think, thank God for a lot of those things, right? Um, uh, staying, you know, per, for your personal life, staying in touch with loved ones over over these technologies. So, so I, I you know, um, like obviously this is a terrible, this is a tragedy for the world, and it's you know, the, I, I, and I, and it, there's really nothing positive about the whole um, situation. But but I think just from a from our internet kind of focus, um, kind of our jobs, it, it's you know we're still it kind of just reinforces our general bullishness on the internet. If, uh, some of the things you said and, and mentioning infrastructure reminded me of uh, the blog post that Mark Andreessen, the founder of your investment firm, wrote recently. It got widely shared online called mm -hmm. It's Time to Build. Um, and, you know, one of the things he was talking about was public infrastructure and how, uh, you know, government has dropped the ball and we need to overhaul a lot of the basic sort of services in our society, whether it's hospitals or uh, schools, things like that. Um, and, and it makes me wonder, you know, a lot of the things that Mark had written about are real tangible sorts of things in society. Um, you know, shouldn't shouldn't the founders out there be focused on like, how can we get vaccines and masks rather than having yep. their heads in the crypto clouds? Well, I think like I, I think of it as I mean, so I say a couple things to that. Like one is I think there's a lot more startup activity in Silicon Valley focused on the kind of real world things, healthcare as an example, then then gets then frankly gets attention. So just for at our firm, for example, we have a uh, we're now in our third bio fund. We just raised a six hundred million dollar bio fund. We have four general partners focused on it. Um, it's literally, you know, investing in the best and brightest kind of next generation who are literally like trying to cure cancer and create vaccines and like that's what they do. That's what that fund does. It just doesn't for, you know, I think for a variety of reasons, it doesn't get the same kind of attention that, you know, the, the uh, kind of a cool social app does or something. Right. I mean, among other things, it's just harder to understand and it's a longer cycle and things like that. But there's a lot of that. We also have like a very active real estate, uh, real estate technology practice. Um, uh, we have a, we have a we have three general partners focused on fintech. And, and within that, real estate is a big part of it. Probably I, I'm just somewhere around, I would say five to 10 significant real estate investments. Um, um, so, so I do think there's more, and, I th and I'm not saying our firm is unique in this way. I think if you go across Silicon Valley, there's a lot of that. Um, uh, so I think there's, I would say, first of all, I think there's more of that than, than, than maybe people realize. Um, um, and I, then I would say, secondly, I think, I think these things, um, I think these things are complex and require multiple Kind of angles to come at them to solve them. So the thing I mentioned earlier about the the history of the limited liability corporation and how that unlocked um, railroad financing, right? There you had something that was sort of a you know kind of an informational digital kind of innovation or whatever you want to call it, the the new type of corporation, very analogous to the kind of stuff we're working on in crypto here, which then in turn solved all these problems and unlocked all this capital flow to build you know physical iron and you know steam and iron and all these other kinds of um, uh, you know, physical things, right? So they're all very well. Can I, I don't think, like, for example, if you think about, I mean, I don't want to get into like kind of these complex issues that are political and other things, but you know, we don't lack for the ability to, like, we don't, we don't have, like, why aren't we building more physical things, right? We don't, we don't have a lack of supplies, materials. We don't have a lack of people who know how to literally build things, right? Um, we don't even have a lack, I would argue, of financing. There's just a ton. Of, the vast majority of money in the world is debt financing, which wants to fund, you know, which whose charter is to fund things like real estate, right? I mean, that's something you have to remember. Venture capital is 0.001. I don't know what the exact number, but it's like 0.001 percent of like investment per. It's a tiny sector from an investment point of view compared to credit, you know, whatever. Citibank making loans, etc. Um, uh, so there's tons of capital there. There's tons of people ready to do it. Some people argue a lot of the issues are kind of regulatory or like, you know, this, this, this sort of nimbyism, this local area doesn't want a new thing. 
people, you know, we've, we've created, I, I think I, I just saw, um, I think it was Ezra Klein tweeting that we've, I think they had a, a Vox post about it, that we've now created a situation where there's too many people with veto power over too many things. Like you look at the World Trade Center and it was like 15 different organizations all had to say yes, which is why it took 15 years and not whatever, less than a year like the Empire State Building. I mean, I don't want to get too much into all these issues, but I would argue that 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 a lot of the issues are not like we don't lack the resources. We lack the ability to coordinate things, to coordinate and kind of get people together and to align incentives. And I would argue with crypto, that's exactly what we're working on. Like this is a crypto is trying to create a better kind of orchestration layer for humanity and the Internet and like a new way to kind of layer on incentives and collective action and sort of get over problems where um we all want it to happen but for whatever reason we can't kind of all get together and agree on it and get to you know and do it so um so I, I think all those things are important the physical stuff very important you know um the, the, those those uh, essential skills are, are are critical but i would argue like we should people like me and people probably who are watching this are probably better at internet stuff than they are at i'm guessing than they are at physically constructing stuff and this is probably the best place for us to use our skills to contribute to that, to contribute to, to, to what Mark was talking about in that post. So uh, I'm going to turn to Q&A in just a minute. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions that have come through. Um, but before I do, uh, just a last question for you, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, what advice do you have for founders who are maybe thinking about dipping their toes into crypto um, but maybe they think they're too late. They missed the boat. There was the, you know, the huge bubble run ups in the past. Uh, this thing's over. Or maybe even people who are working in this space now um, and might just need some encouragement to stay the course. Yeah. So I, I think you're definitely not too late. Kevin Kelly has one of my favorite essays. It's, uh, he's, a, he's a journalist who uh, it says you're not too late. And he talks about how this is the very beginning. And it was a couple of years ago, but I think it still applies. I'll, I'll find it afterwards if people are interested. But um, uh, no, I think these are the good old days. These are the days I always love reading. I love reading history books. I love particularly reading history books about technology. You know, there's that great, I tweeted out before that great uh, Steve Jobs and Wozniak holding up the first Apple One motherboard. Like those are the, you think about the PC, like those are the golden days, like Woz and Jobs and Gates and all these guys and, you know, in the seventies, these are the golden days. These are the golden days of crypto. These are the days they'll look back on They'll be like, yeah, I went to this Ready Layer One conference and there were X many people. And I get this to this, this day. It's funny. People are like, how do you know so-and-so from the Internet? I'm like, because there were 15 of us in like in 2004 or whatever when I started. When I started first, my first kind of consumer Internet, not in the Internet, but in like that particular kind of sector of the Internet. But like, and that's how it is now. Like, we all kind of know each other. It's a small industry. These are the good old days. These are the days when like you can go and you can really make a mark. You can be the was and jobs of the crypto industry. Um, uh, you know, you can, you can, um, uh, these, these are the things, days that people will write books about someday, um, that, uh, um, you know, they'll look back on and say, wow, they had it so easy. It was so obvious back then. Um, it's obviously not obvious, but this is how it always looks in my view. So these, these, these are, um, I think it's a great time and you're not, you're definitely not too late. Um, I don't, you may be too early, but you're definitely not too late. I don't think you're too early. I hope you're not too early, but <laughs> Well, you're working on a, on a what, 10 year timeline. So you've got some time. Yeah. Um, all right. So we've had some questions come in. I'll read a few of them. Great. Uh, time that we have remaining. I think we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, first one is a great question. What will it take? And this is one my editors love to ask me. What mm -hmm. will it take to bring crypto mainstream? What's going to be the killer app? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think about that, like, again, I like, I like to think kind of through historical analogies, just because these, these things are so complex that you can try to kind of draw a line out, you know, kind of take extrapolate things, but it's sometimes better to look back on history. Um, um, I think that, uh, I think the credible, so I don't have, the short answer is I don't have the answer. I think there's a lot of credible concepts. Um, and I think back on like mobile where, you know, a very interesting book called is called Losing the Signal. It's about the founders of uh, RIM, which is the company behind BlackBerry. Um, and they basically, uh, it's very interesting because the, their competitors at the time were all building general purpose uh, computing, mobile computing platforms. So it was like Microsoft, Sidekick, Trio, there's a bunch of them, Palm Pilot. And they were just trying to build like kind of like handheld computers, right? And what the uh, what the RIM folks said is, no, you know what we should, here's our belief. Our belief is the killer app is going to be messaging, essentially WhatsApp today, 
they called it email back then, but like it was messaging, right? It was it was messaging where you type it and then it instantly gets to the person as opposed to having to go and like pull down for those who remember the Blackberry. It was the first kind of WhatsApp like experience. And they, they said, that's gonna be the killer app. Um, and the problem with these general purpose computing platforms is that they, uh, they, they don't have a great experience for that. Um, uh, so they went out and they they did they built this whole full stack thing end to end. It's really fascinating. Um, they they built the device, they built the software on the device, they built their own kind of compression so that it would work really highly performant. They went out and rented all the cellular minutes. They built the backend system. They built the whole thing. And what they were able to do is they were able to push the future, pull the future forward. Um, now fast forward, then the iPhone and Android came along, and and what they built really became just an app on top of those platforms and. You know they're still around and doing well, but they're they kind of not not what they once were. Um, and so you know I think for example a very so so one question sort of what will be the kind of BlackBerry moment? Will be the sort of the first application that really kind of goes mainstream? I think payments are a very likely plausible candidate. That's what that's what projects like Libra are doing. I think stuff around video games uh, are very exciting. Uh, we have an investment in a company called Forte that's that's already launched a bunch of games that have crypto powered kind of secondary markets and virtual good markets. Um, Gaming world is very, uh, it's a huge world. It's you know, hundreds of millions of people. They're very used to virtual goods and these kinds of ideas of like digital value. Um, it's not the end result. We obviously want crypto to be bigger than just gaming, but gaming has often historically been a very good kind of entry point. A lot of the early successful iPhone apps for games as an example. It's always been, it's always been kind of a good uh, entryway into kind of gateway thing into new technologies. So I think I would say payments are one. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff like like DeFi, which I know, you know, it's not mainstream, but the numbers are significant. Like the the uh, um, there's a lot of uh, volume of sort of people using these these protocols and and interacting with them. Um, and, you know, it, it only takes a few steps to go from like a, um, a kind of a insular kind of a, a crypto fan enthusiast only product to um, to you know if with the right kind of interface and user experience those things can then cross over into a much broader market so I don't know the, an the exact answer I think we have a bunch of kind of hypotheses and obviously we have the luxury of having a portfolio and we sort of make um, uh, investments according to that but uh, um, but and going back also like you know Bitcoin I think the the number of Bitcoin holders is in the I think it's it's hard to, you know, it's obviously because everything's crypto is anonymous, but I think there's well over 100 million kind of Bitcoin holders. And I think it has high brand recognition and you know, it's kind of a real global brand. And we're seeing evidence that um, if you go look at there's a lot of interesting data sources where you can see it being used in, a, in what appears to be a real kind of store of value use case in countries that have, um, uh, you know, issues with the currency and other kinds of things. So I think it's starting to to uh, get traction in kind of non speculative use cases. Uh, you mentioned a few areas in there that uh, are definitely uh, ripe for this, like payments and video games. Sometimes with video games, uh, things like Slack come out the other side. So that's you know, right. where, where things might lead. And that was a great investment for uh, Andreessen. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's true. No, it's that's, that's another that's a great point in startups. Um, it's a, I, I would say Slack is a good example where it's just a kind of illustrative of how hard it is to predict exactly where both startups go and also where kind of future technology trends go. And that, um, you know, going back to your question about entrepreneurial advice, like one of the big things too is to sort of stay alive, uh, work with great people and continue to iterate and release products. And, you know, um, eventually, uh, you know, hopefully that will, that will pay off. So I've avoided asking you any price prediction questions, but yeah. the audience wants to know, uh, you know, give us an example of an investment you think will outperform Bitcoin in eight years. I can't. I, I don't think. I will. Um, I, I think that one is I don't like. We don't like to make price predictions just because for a variety of reasons. But I think also from a um, regulatory perspective, I'm not allowed to say something like that. Um, I think that I, we're, like we're look, we're very bullish on on all these technologies and. You know, we think about everything through a very long term lens that if if they kind of our basic kind of assumption is if if a technology ends up being used by billions of people, it will be extremely valuable. Um, we don't know exactly how valuable. We don't know how long that will take. But the kind of the key condition is you create something really valuable and you get it to hundreds of millions of billions of people. So we just look at everything that lens and then we just assume that the kind of the, the, the prices and the and the returns will take care of themselves if we get that right. 
I quite like this question. Somebody wants to know what questions are regularly being asked internally at Andreessen Horowitz? About crypto or, gen or general? The question is open-ended. So yeah, I mean, look, I think we're, like everybody, we're trying to figure out the state of the world. And, uh, you know, I think obviously with the, with the uh, pandemic situation, but I think more broadly, um, and we try to, um, I think we try to have a culture of, um, you know, questioning and self-questioning and challenging each other. And, um, um, and so, you know, I think we're, we see it as sort of a constant process of sort of searching for the truth and understanding the world. Um, and right now, yeah, I think right now, kind of the main thing is making sure that um, the companies that, that we partner with, um, you know, can make it through and their employees and are treated, you know, uh, are hopefully looked after and just all those kinds of things and our employees, frankly. And um, so I think a lot of it, probably like a lot of people right now, we're kind of more in, uh, um, in, in you know, focus on those issues right now, uh, as opposed to, uh, yeah, more for all, you know, hopefully at some point things stabilize and we're able to kind of think more about a uh, broader, broader set of topics. But Got it. Um, the audience would also like to know what sorts of crypto and in particular DeFi applications, decentralized finance applications, do you use personally? Do you use any regularly? Yeah, I do. We have, it's, it's tricky with our reg. So it's one of the ironies is that because we run a crypto fund and we're, we're, uh, we're an RIA, we're a, a registered investment advisor. We have all sorts of uh, like, I can't just go and loan money on, compound or something. Um, but we do have, what we did is we finally figured out how to do it. We set up a kind of a pool of money that we are able to, to experiment with. So we try to, we try to use all these products. Yeah, for sure. I've got, you know, Coinbase wallet on my phone. I've done all, used all these DEXs. I've lent money. I've done other things. Um, um, yeah, I think that, I think it's getting, you know, it's not there yet, I think in terms of the user experience and just like, it's still kind of wonky and nerdy, um, but it's getting a lot better and very quickly. And there's a whole bunch of really smart people working on those problems. And so, um, so yeah, we, we definitely use it as all these things uh, to make sure that we're kind of on the cutting edge of understanding the products and the user experience. Um, uh, we are a little more constrained based on our kind of regulatory structure as to, our ability to get go out and you know we're not we can't go and like lend a large amount of money on one of these DeFi protocols. Was that a big lift to become an RIA? Yeah, um, it's uh, and it's an investment and it we, it was very important to us because you know we really want to lean into the what we think is the the futuristic business model which is the to which is tokens um, and and we think you know we think owning we think that. Um, token that the the correctly built crypto projects the value will accrue to tokens and that one of the things that makes silicon valley and startup the startup world work so well is the alignment among investors founders employees and in this case also the community and we felt it was very important that we have a structure where we could we could be kind of first class participants in that new world and specifically that means own tokens and uh this without going into all the the kind of details um uh, the venture capital firms are typically this other status called the ERAs where they can't, they get their limited how many tokens they can hold. And so we, we went and changed our status and that meant an investment. We have a chief compliance officer. We have to do a whole bunch of other things. Uh, I can't make price predictions. <laughs> um, I don't really make them anyways, uh, near term or anything, but, um, but, uh, but, but there's like constraints and things on, on the way we can, we can uh, talk about things and, and, uh, so yeah, it was, but I think it, we think it was important, and and we hope that over time that um, we can, you know, that we can uh, uh, find a model, help maybe pioneer a model where we can act kind of more like we used to as venture capitalists, and 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 not have to moderate so much of the things we say and everything else, um, and also you know own the mo what we think are the modern assets, which is tokens. Um, uh, for now, this is kind of this. Uh, intermediate kind of compromise that we ended up with, but. Got it. Um, the audience would also like to know, uh, since crypto innovations come from the fringes, how can investors spot important ones early enough to get exposure? 
But where are you picking up on the most interesting new novel trends? Yeah, it's a great. That's a great question. Um, you know, I think part of it is, I mean, you know, part of this is just the beauty of the internet, right? So we we spend a lot of time, um, obviously, in the same places that hopefully the fringe people do, and we're all, you know, on our team, we're all active on various internet communities and you know GitHub and things. We actually, though, also um, uh, recently. Uh, Eddie Lazarin has joined us, who's our first, uh, he came from Netflix and before that Facebook, he's our first data scientist on the team. Um, and we think we might invest more heavily in that function in the future. Um, and, and so what he's doing is literally like going and analyzing, you know, activity on various places. And, you know, when we ask questions like, hey, how's, you know, how's the Ethereum developer community doing? Like he can go and like run queries and like really kind of analyze it and things like that. So that's kind of a new thing. and. VCs have done that in the past, but we think it can be a, it'll be potentially a bigger thing uh, in crypto as, as it grows. Um, it happens a lot actually in the open source uh, VC kind of investment community. There's a whole thing we call enterprise, you know, enterprise infrastructure where they're investing in like Databricks, which is sort of the, the corporate entity uh, associated with Spark as an example. Um, and so anyway, so we're, we're building out different function capabilities like that. Um, what else can I say? Um, uh, you know, we we try to be. I think we're. You know, we've had a, made a bunch of investments in the, outside of Silicon Valley, more so than I think in in our traditional uh, venture activities. Uh, a few larger investments in Europe. Um, um, you know, so just kind of try to be more flexible with respect to those things. Um, um, and I don't know, just try to you know have a. We, I think we have a great team, and just ha trying to have a kind of a, a team that's sort of plugged in and modern and staying in touch with all these trends and take a lot of meetings and hopefully, you know, uh, are pretty relatively accessible. We try to be. And so, you know, hopefully that makes us more open to finding interesting new stuff. Uh, we're nearing the top of the hour here, which would be the conclusion of our conversation. So I'll ask you just mm -hmm. one more question. What is the most underrated project out there right now? Or if not projects, underrated concept, idea. That's a good question. I mean, I might have the DAO thing. I don't know if, if that's still counter trend, but that's certainly probably my favorite, one of my very favorite things. And I don't know. It, I mean, it's in the hardcore community. DAOs are popular. I think uh, what I what we we wrote a blog post and we announced our new fund. Uh, what, what people call Web three is a very exciting area to me. So this is. I think so much attention is paid to financial applications of crypto that some of the non financial ones are neglected. Um, I think the idea that, like I've said here, uh, you could build a social network using this architecture, um, what Twitter has actually talked about doing in their project Blue Sky, that you could build a social network that sort of any developer can come along and adapt it and extend it and remix it. Um, so the kind of the thing we had with the first year of the internet where you just had this really kind of cool kind of remixing and composability aspect, I think got lost in the second wave, the Web2 era, where you had great services with great user experiences, but you lost the ability to remix and recombine. Um, so I think if we had that again, where we had sort of community owned and operated uh, networks that could be remixed and recombined, um, that would be super exciting. Um, so I think the non-financial use cases might be underhyped, I guess, of, of, of blockchain. So. Well, uh, thank you so much for all your time, Chris. I, I hope that everybody here got something out of this. Uh, you know, I know you're looking for new projects to invest in, so. Um, everybody, you, you heard what Chris is interested in. Uh, thank, thank you, Robert. And uh, thanks, everyone who, who watched. Excellent. OK, take care. Awesome, guys. Well, really appreciate your time, both Robert and Chris. Uh, yeah, uh, it's very fascinating times, you know, especially with the uh, community owned infrastructure with DAOs and and just so much. So really appreciate your insights and really looking forward to see, you know, the projects that you continue to to lead.